to watch my exclusive content not featured anywhere on YouTube, log on to my website at I'm just here to make you think dot com slash films. Now, everyone knows this guy is Donald Trump, or now the President of the United States. Or some of you may even refer to him as many different pseudonyms deriving from some people that may have a difference of opinion about Trump to say the very least. And before I go any further, let's be very clear that I am not endorsing any political party within this video or any of my other published works, investigative research anything I write or anything else that has to do with me for that matter. I decided to create this video because I noticed a common pattern that popular news media outlets will use for someone else's advantage when it comes to breaking news stories concerning Donald Trump. Did you notice how rare it is to find a news media company that actually had something remotely nice to say about Trump? Now don't get me wrong. There are many things that I disagree with when it comes to Trump's policies, executive orders, and thoughts on particular subjects, etc. But why is it that every single news media broadcast about Trump that we see campaigns negative commentary concerning his every single move, even before his announcement to run for president? And from a totally unbiased perspective, that doesn't seem odd to you? allowed any information that turned out to be so false and fake out. I think it's a disgrace. And I say that, and I say that, and that's something that Nazi Germany would have done and did do. I think it's a disgrace. That information that was false and fake and never happened got released to the public. As far as BuzzFeed, which is a failing pile of garbage, writing it, I think they're going to suffer the consequences, they already are. And as far as CNN going out of their way to build it up, and by the way, we just found out I was coming down, Michael Cohn, I was being, Michael Cohn is a very talented lawyer, he's a good lawyer in my firm. It was just reported that it wasn't this Michael Cohn they were talking about. So all night long, it's Michael Cohn. I said, I want to see your passport. He brings his passport to my office. I say, hey, wait a minute, he didn't leave the country. He wasn't out of the country. They had Michael Cohn of the Trump Organization was in Prague. It turned out to be a different Michael Cohn. It's a disgrace what took place. It's a disgrace. And I think they ought to apologize to start with Michael Cohn. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. No, not you. Not you. Your organization's terrible. Your organization's terrible. Let's go. Go ahead. Quiet. Quiet. Go ahead. She's she's asking a question. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. No, I'm not going to give you a question. I'm not going to give you a question. You are fake news. Go ahead. Trump is famous for calling particular news channels fake news. And I concur that his assessment of these particular channels are royally accurate being as though most of them are in fact affiliated with controlled opposition. See the video linked above to learn more about that. And with that being said, we can determine that some of these news media outlets are designed to formulate social influence, both the good and the bad kind. And what's alarming here is how particular news media outlets would literally chop and edit what Trump actually says about particular topics. And then they would go on with the broadcast for that day and make it seem as if he was saying something entirely different. 
in a negative sense. For example, Trump was accused of mocking the American Indians when he blatantly called out Elizabeth Warren for identifying as an Indian in order to gain grants for higher education and among other things that she shouldn't have due to his belief that she is not a real Indian, mocking her by referring to her as Pocahontas. Who, Pocahontas? <laughs> Pocahontas, well, no, she's, should, should look, look she is, she, is it offensive? offensive? You tell me, oh, oh, right. oh I'm sorry about yes. that. Uh, Pocahontas, is that what you said? Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren? She is a senator that's highly overrated. She's passed very little legislation. She has been a real disaster for a lot of people, including the Democrats, who frankly can't stand her, many of the Democrats. Just ask Hillary Clinton how she likes her. And I would say this, I'll debate anybody, I don't care. I'd debate her. Uh, but she's done very little for Massachusetts. So I, I really think if her record was exposed and the fact that she was a Native American, she said she was Native American, but she wasn't able to document it. She said, well, I have high cheekbones. You see, I have high cheekbones, so I'm a Native American. And she then, I don't know if you'd call it a fraud or not, but she was able to get into various schools because of the fact she applied as a Native American and probably able to get other things. I think she's as Native American as I am, okay? That I will tell you. And then out of nowhere, an old video resurfaced where Trump stated at a 1993 Indian Affairs Committee hearing. They don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like the Indians. Now, maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct. They don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like Indians to Indians. And a lot of people are laughing at it. And you're telling how tough it is, how rough it is to get approved. Well, you go up to Connecticut and you look. Now, they don't look like Indians to me, sir. Now, on the surface, the media painted the picture around this time as if Trump was mocking Elizabeth Warren and the American Indians, when in fact he was simply exposing the fraudulent activities surrounding the acceptance of new members of Indian tribes and nations alike, and which I go into this topic a lot more here in this video linked above. So now, in the 1993 video where Trump stated that they don't look like Indians to me, Let's go over that information that some of these news media outlets either overlooked, never looked at, or purposely bypassed altogether in order to control the narrative. And be sure to leave your comments below and tell me what you think. Donald Trump appeared before the Subcommittee on Indian Affairs on October 5th, 1993. And according to the transcript of this particular hearing, a lot of what was mentioned here has been edited out of the video by whomever news media company released this video, in part for defamation purposes solely directed at Trump's reputation as a credible source for Robert Torricilli's proposed legislation on the Indian gaming industry. You are in the fighting ring of history. We stand with the people of Ashraf we stand with the MEK. We stand with the people in the streets of Iran fighting for freedom. We stand for freedom. You stand to defend your corruption, your oppression, the denial of freedom. One of us will win, one will lose. One will die, one will live, and I'm betting on us every day of the week. And if you think that our internal divisions mean that a Democratic Party one day will return to power to save you, you are betting on the wrong horse. We stand with President Trump in destroying the regime. Finally, On page 163 of the transcript is where Donald Trump is introduced to the committee by Robert Torricilli who was a representative in Congress from the state of New Jersey. But just before Trump was introduced, Robert informed the committee of some very important concerns surrounding the Indian gaming industry. It says here that Robert stated to the chairman, for almost a century, my state and many areas of this country have been plagued with the scourge of organized crime. It has been a parasite on businesses that have legitimately attempted to operate in my state 
and indeed been an embarrassment to many parts of our community. After extraordinary efforts by the federal government and significant changes in the law in recent years, by any accounts, we are close to breaking the back of organized crime. But an extraordinary irony is arising. Just as we find family after family that are being broken, it is my own judgment that a drowning mafia is being tossed a lifeline for its own survival. Unregulated casino gaming without supervisions to do background checks or investigations has opened an enormous door for the survival of organized crime as we know it. Indeed, a multi-billion dollar operation is already operating in this country. Without question, some of the 175 operations in 26 states are already compromised. It can be no surprise that 22 serious allegations have already been made concerning some of these operations. Mr. Chairman, I think just for a moment, it bears citing what some of these allegations are. I would not attempt to name most of them, but I will mention only a few. The state of California, Barona Rancheria, Stuart Siegel admitted to being a front for organized crime. He has for a while headed the tribe's management firm. Cabazon Indian Tribe in California, after Tribal Vice President Fred Alvarez began complaining of money skimming, he mysteriously was found dead with two friends. The Rincon Indian Reservation in San Diego County, Sam Wings, and eight other organized crime figures were indicted in a 15-count indictment compromised of felony charges. Jackson Rancheria, Anthony Tumac managed a bingo hall in 1985. He recently was convicted as being head of the Lucci's organized crime family. The state of Minnesota, the White Earth Tribe, Angelo Medjure, an alleged associate of the Pittsburgh organized crime figure, Carmen Ritchie, an alleged associate of New Jersey Scarfo, who indeed had attempted to penetrate New Jersey casino gaming in previous years, has raised an investigation by law enforcement personnel. In the state of New York, as I cited earlier, in the Mohawk tribe, an associate of John Gotti was arrested for shipping slot machines to the reservations. And in my own state of New Jersey, the Ramapo Indians employed one Robert Frank as a consultant. He was later convicted, along with Mr. Asaturo, of racketeering and extortion, of being the head of New Jersey's Lucci's crime family. Not anecdotes, Mr. Chairman, 22 states, 22 instances where the threat of organized crime is not a theory. It is not somebody's conspiracy. It is a reality of everyday life. And the question is, what is this committee and what is Congress going to do to deal with the problem? End quote. Notice how this narrative has nothing to do with Donald Trump, but the media influenced some of the public to believe the narrative that this was merely Trump's way to make room for only his benefit, when in fact, Trump was there in support of legislation proposed by Robert himself to Congress. Robert goes on and says, 49 governors, and indeed the President of the United States, have all cited the current state of affairs cannot be allowed to continue. This committee heard previously from Senator Inouye claiming that negotiations with the governors would solve this problem. But indeed, a letter from the Governor's Association that Senator Inouye has received claims that those negotiations are not adequate and they are not coming to a resolution and that indeed this Congress must act. Mr. Chairman, I know the good intentions of this Congress and of this committee in trying to open opportunity for Indian Americans. I do not come before you claiming that there are no problems with Indian Americans. They are profound and they are an embarrassment to each and every American. We have violated our word. We have not respected the most basic human rights of our Native Americans. But this is no answer. We are doing no favor to Indian American culture by destroying it by opening up Indian gaming as a protected industry for them. We are destroying their culture. We are destroying their traditional leadership by inviting corruption in an industry without oversight, without basic controls for money laundering." End quote. So Robert Torsilli then proceeds to detail how his concerns are not only about organized crime, 
or the Indian culture, but how all this affects the state of New Jersey, which is expected, of course, being as though that's his job anyways. And then he goes on and introduces Donald Trump and says that, quote, the state of New Jersey knows Donald Trump. He chose to do business in Atlantic City, so we know who invests in his companies. We know who he buys his supplies from. We know who works for him. We know who walks in his casinos with cash, where it came from and where it went. We know a lot about Mr. Trump, and we know a lot about everybody who attempted to come to Atlantic City. From established organizations like the Hilton organization through many lesser applicants, we rejected people because they didn't meet our standards. And today, we spend not millions, but many millions of dollars, not simply with a few inspectors, but hundreds of inspectors, to make sure that the same people who I cited as being involved in organized crime in Indian casinos throughout this country will not be in the state of New Jersey. We chased them out. We kept them out. They are out. And because they are out of the state of New Jersey, they are seeking to take advantage of Native Americans who want opportunity but who will be victimized if we fail to protect them. I don't want to see discrimination. I want no part of denying opportunities to Native Americans. I come today not because in spite of those who will restrict their opportunities, it is simply a question of assuring that they are safeguarded, like Atlantic City and Las Vegas are safeguarded, and indeed that we all are protected against these elements, which we are so close to defeating in our country. With that, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I would like to yield to Mr. Trump. Trump is then allowed to speak, and he begins to immediately echo the words of Congressman Robert Torricelli, saying that organized crime is rampant on the Indian reservations, and that what is happening on the Indian reservations is known by the Indians to a large extent. This is where Trump is seen stating part of this segment via video. If this continues as a threat, it's my opinion that it will blow. It will blow sky high. It will be the biggest scandal ever, or one of the biggest scandals since Al Capone in terms of organized crime. I believe that there's gonna be a lot of embarrassed and a lot of red faces. But to sit here and listen, as people are saying that there's no organized crime, that there's no money laundering, that there's no anything, and that an Indian chief is going to tell Joey Killer to please get off his reservation is almost unbelievable to me. The name Joey Killer that Trump alluded to here is the name of a New York Mafia based assassin of Italian descent, in which Joey eventually released his own book in 1974 entitled Killer, Autobiography of a Mafia Hitman, which goes in detail about his lifestyle. So, in other words, Trump is warning Congress about what exactly is taking place in the casino gaming industry, money laundering and other crimes involving organized criminals that just so happens to involve many Indian tribes because of their nation's leaders being vulnerable to possible malicious forces of unwarranted business practices and social influences. On the topic of rampant organized crime, infiltration on Indian gaming, Donald Trump is asked by Representative Bill Richardson, a Democrat congressman for New Mexico, has he presented this evidence to the FBI or to this committee? Do you have documentation of that? Then Trump responded by saying, quote, well, what I have is I have many, many instances of events one after another. Organized crime figures, killings, deaths, laundering or money. I mean, I could read them to you. Wisconsin, White Earth Tribe and and all the Apache tribe. All instances one after another. I have more instances for you. You folks know that. I really believe you know that. And I can give you any documentation I have. Not only was this part left out from the video, but the media intentionally does not mention that Trump did in fact submit his sources and evidence to this committee.
after Trump stated that the Indians has no help against outside infiltration. Richardson replied by saying, quote, well, Mr. Trump, I don't agree with that. Let me just say we want your evidence. Now, you have detailed that in your opening statement. We want to investigate this. This committee is not trying to cover anything up. We are interested in this issue, end quote. But wait a minute. Why would Bill Richardson say that this committee is not trying to cover anything up when Trump never alluded to that point at any time during this hearing in the first place? Did he inadvertently admit to the committee's possible involvement of any of these crimes? This is also where the video picks up exactly and you hear the other half of Richardson's reply to Trump. You have basically stated uh, that the problem seems to be that the FBI doesn't have any people, or is that correct? Is the issue that uh, you... No, I think it's far beyond that. I, I think that people have got paper bags over their faces and nobody's looking. Everybody, it seems to me, from even just a common sense standpoint, knows what's going on. The video is then edited here to remove the part where Trump continues on with his statement by saying, quote, I can tell you this, in New Jersey, you have what is called a blacklist or a list of people that we're not allowed to do business with. These people were a constant source of irritation. I can supply the list of names if you would like the list of names, but it was a large list of names and these were not very good people and some of them were plenty rough. These people were a constant irritation, a constant problem. We weren't supposed to, but they were always trying to get in trying to be down there, trying to do whatever they do, and it was a constant source. Robert Torricelli chimes in and says to the committee that, I was a young lawyer in our governor's office in New Jersey when we legalized casino gaming. And I think that experience will help answer your question. We were extraordinarily naive. We passed good laws to keep organized crime out of the casinos. And I'm proud of what we did. A year hadn't gone by when they were monopolizing vending machines and then laundry operations. You will never find the presence of organized crime without an intensive effort. It is said there are none so blind as those who will not see. I didn't come here to embarrass the FBI today in my questioning. It was simply to point out that this would take a concerted effort Mr. Trump may, by chance, come upon a name, as I have in these 22 instances, from the popular media. But I will assure you, if the popular media can find 22 states with organized crime involvement in a cursory look, a dedicated effort by the FBI is going to find something more substantial. I first came to this issue in an interesting way. I heard constituents of mine were raising money to create a management company in South Dakota to run an Indian bingo hall. I knew who they were and I knew they were connected and I got curious with the issue. That case isn't here, never been written about, nobody even knows about it. But this will not come from citizens rushing to the FBI. It will come because we have a concerted effort to establish laws, to regulate, and then to fine." End quote. Bill Richardson then says that he agrees with his colleague, referring to Robert Torricelli, and then he states that he has a question for Trump. And this is where the video picks back up. Did you submit this list to the FBI at any time? Uh, I'm not a law enforcement officer. I'm not supposed to be going around checking Indian reservations. That what you, that's what you have the FBI for, and they're very capable, the most capable. But that's not my job. Then the video is edited again here to leave out the rest of Trump's reply, which he says, quote, My job is to come here and tell you that from a standard of the largest casino operator in the world, which I am, I would tell you that there is no way the gaming industry is going to be controlled and not be totally taken advantage and, in my opinion, totally taken over in almost every instance by the mob. There is no way that the Indians are going to protect themselves from the mob. There is no way. Bill Richardson responds by saying, quote, 
but we have no evidence that the FBI has checked any of the 22 instances out. Then Trump says, quote, you can't have evidence when the FBI doesn't have one man assigned to Indian gaming. How can you have evidence? That is exactly the point. This transcript is not really hard to track down, but I'll be sure to add a link on my Patreon so that you all may have copies of this transcript along with all of the evidence presented during this hearing. Log on to patreon.com forward slash Dane Calloway and click the link attached to this associated post to download your copies. The video is then clipped to the part where Representative Neil Abercrombie, I think that's how you pronounce it, a Democrat of Hawaii, as he seems to be annoyed with Trump during this portion of the video. If you indicate that they don't pay taxes, I didn't indicate they don't pay taxes. I said they're not paying taxes on casino. Oh, that's not because the profits on. from it are to go to the reservations. Oh, really? Then, as you can see, Trump's reply is immediately edited out from the video. At this point of the hearing, according to the transcript, Trump continues by saying, quote, Oh, really? What about the $400 million profit that they get? The 300 Indians? Then Neil responds, if you would, Mr. Trump, if you would get less rhetorical and more back to the facts, I think we could get somewhere with this testimony. The profits go back to the reservation, go back for expeditions on behalf of Indians. Therefore, a logical person, you are the one who has brought up the question of, it stands to reason, and we have to use common sense. It is common sense that it is in the interest of Indian tribes to see that the games are run honestly, because the more money that comes into the tribe, the more that can be spent on the reservation on behalf of Indian children, on behalf of elderly people, the same people that you have expressed an interest in. Then Trump says, respectfully, sir, I really don't believe you understand. And if you do, then we have a bigger problem. What we have is when the tough guys, the bad guys walk onto that reservation, I really don't believe that an Indian leader will be able to tell that gentleman to get the hell off. This shows just how adamant Trump was during this time period with exposing how the Indian gaming industry has been infiltrated by well-known organized crime figures and how everyone that spoke during this meeting so far was simply not listening or not even caring to attempt to further investigate the evidence presented to them during this hearing. Then the video jumps to Representative George Miller, a Democrat of California, who also seemed annoyed by Trump, and he stated this. In spite of the FBI testimony that this is not a significant problem, Mr. Trump, in one, in one sentence you say uh, uh, they are the most capable of agencies and that you're not a law enforcement expert, and then you tell us that you have superior knowledge to their knowledge about uh, the extent of uh, organized crime on Indian reservations. You've got a totally closed mind on the, no, no, on no, the subject, sir. Trump. We could walk in here with the greatest proof in the history of the world, and frankly, your mind is so closed for whatever reason that I can't believe it. But you don't but have if that. You really wanna, you don't have if you really want to study this, yes. when you tell me that there are no FBI agents assigned to the Indian reservations, and yet you have tremendous numbers in Las Vegas and in Atlantic City, tremendous numbers. In fact, two of their largest places. I want to tell you something you have a long way to go. And for whatever reason, you have a closed mind. I don't know why. Perhaps you could tell me. No, Mr. Trump, I have a closed mind against evidence that is not substantiated. Oh, well. I have a closed mind against statements that are made about other people in general. You're going to be very embarrassed in two years, sir. You go on a radio show and you say, now some drunken Indians want to come down here and open a, a residence. I didn't say that, sir. Quote it. I didn't say that. Who said that? Who said that? I'd like an apology right now because I didn't say that. I must open the broadcast, so excuse me, Mr. I must said that. Okay, I said could that. I please have an apology? You can have an apology. Thank you, sir. And then you went on to, is this you discussing Indian blood? We're going to judge people by whether they have Indian blood, whether they're qualified to run a gaming casino or not? Uh, uh, that probably is me, absolutely, because I'll tell you what, if you look, if you look at some of the reservations that you've approved you sir in your great wisdom have approved 
I will tell you right now, uh, they don't look like Indians to me. Now, let's stop here for a second. Congressman George Miller is quoting from a transcript of a morning radio show that is hosted by Don Imus called Imus in the Morning, in which Donald Trump was interviewed by Imus on the date of June 18, 1993. Don Imus was a famous radio personality, and more importantly, he grew to fame based solely on his comedic style approach when addressing his audience, his guests, co-hosts, and anybody else in between. But about the host of a syndicated radio show, Don Imus, a 56-year-old cadaverous stormy petrel full of himself and his gritty opinions. Every weekday morning, he and his stock company of bomb throwers broadcast a raucous repertoire of smut, bigotry, and political satire. His upscale listeners tune in because he's not as filthy as Howard Stern, he's less partisan than Rush Limbaugh, and he is often thoughtfully provocative. A little over a week ago, when I must spoke at a dinner in Washington for media bigwigs and political hotshots, he attacked just about everyone in sight, including the president and the first lady, some would say viciously. So, who is Don Imus? Who is this aging bad boy who signs on the air as Imus in the morning? His views were considered by some to be very controversial, but he didn't mind because he knew that was the main reason why people continued to support him throughout his lengthy 50-year-old career. He makes a lot of money, about $4 million a year, attacking the high and mighty in Washington. Because they're gutless weasels and they're hypocritical phonies. During this interview, I must state quote, So what is this now? A bunch of these drunken engines want to open a casino down in New Jersey? And then Trump replied, Well, it's a battle that we're fighting, and I think it's being successfully fought. A lot of the reservations are being, in some people's opinion, at least to a certain extent, run by organized crime and organized crime elements, as you can imagine. There's no protection. There's no anything. And it's become a joke. It's become a laughing joke. And the politicians around 1987 passed a law where the Indians can have virtually unsupervised casino gaming. So we're in there fighting it. And I think we're making a lot of progress. I think you'll see some very major things happening over the next couple of months. Imus responded, in your mind, is there any legitimacy in them being allowed to have casinos in states where there are none now? Like say, Connecticut? Trump responded, I think it's up to the states. I mean, one of the things we did is bring a lawsuit and say it's states' rights. As an example, Governor Cuomo in New York didn't want to have the Indians having casinos. The churches didn't want it. It knocks out the bingo. It knocks out the charities. It knocks out a lot of other things. So what they did is they filed suits and they filed everything else. Ultimately, the governor of New York was forced to pass this horrendous situation that's taking place in upstate New York. I think it's going to be changed, and I think it's going to be changed fairly quickly, Don. Ima said, so will Indians be allowed to open casinos here in New York? Trump said, I think it's going to be unlikely within the next year. Ima said, okay, this is just my opinion, but I don't think it makes sense to anybody to have Indians operate casinos in New Jersey. Then Trump says, General George Custer was against it also, and look what happened to him. Trump mentioned the name George Custer, referencing how George and his small group of 200 or so soldiers were not prepared to see the Sioux and the Cheyenne Indians fight back with a vengeance that eventually led to George's death at the scene of his last battle, called the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. So being sarcastic, Don Imus said that it didn't make sense to anybody to have Indians operate casinos in New Jersey. And Trump replied by alluding to the possibility that you could be killed if you don't work with the Indians. Or in this sense, Trump is saying that your business can be killed if you don't do business with the Indians that live there. Imus responded, but in New Jersey, obviously you have three casinos. You already have casinos. Trump says, right, but the difference is I pay taxes. The Indians aren't paying any taxes. The Indians aren't putting anything back into what's happening. 
The funny thing is Kumo was forced to put, and now all of a sudden they send him certified letters. We want bridges. They call it the sovereign nation. They call it a nation. This great sovereign nation, the Indian tribes. All of a sudden, it's nations. Before, it wasn't a nation. Before gambling, now it's this great sovereign nation. We protect, we do this, we do that. But when it comes to gambling, it's a sovereign nation. So it's really a double standard and no taxes are paid. No supervision is there, tremendous crime. And most of the Indians don't want it themselves. The leaders, you know, all chiefs and no Indians. And the leaders want it for the obvious reason. But I think it's something that's going to end or is certainly going to be supervised very, very stringently. Trump pointed out something very important here concerning the descriptions that were originally used and then later changed all of a sudden to represent a totally different purpose. Where Trump said they call it the sovereign nation. They call it a nation. This great sovereign nation, the Indian tribes. All of a sudden, it's nations. The term tribe is defined as a family race or series of generations descending from the same progenitor, meaning ancestor, and kept distant. And the term nation is defined as a large body of people inhabiting the same country or united under the same sovereign or government. The term nation is synonymous with words like kingdom, republic, Federation, Confederation, Superpower, Society, Empire, and State, just to name a few things. This means that the term nation has nothing to do with the ethnicity of a group of people, like the Indians in the sense. The main purpose of a nation is to combine a large number of people, no matter their genetic makeup, under one umbrella of dictatorship by way of rules and regulations of one particular council of authorities, foreign and domestic. So this means that if you shall join a nation, then you must simply abide by their laws regardless of your opinions of who they shall choose to do business with. And in most cases, the leaders of these nations are strictly the beneficiaries and not its nation's members. And Trump sarcastically alludes to this fact here in the interview when Imus asked him, would there be any reason if push comes to shove for you to become a member of these tribes? And Trump responded, well, I think if we lost various things, I would perhaps become an Indian myself. Imus came in and said, you know, do one of those Robert Bly deals. Don Imus mentioned the name Robert Bly who was famous for influencing men to become somebody that they are not. So continuing on with the joke, Trump replied saying, well, I think I might have more Indian blood than a lot of the so-called Indians that are trying to open up the reservations. I looked at one of them. Well, I won't go into the whole story, but I could tell you, I said to him, I think I have more Indian blood in me than you have in you. And he laughed at me and he sort of acknowledged that I was right, but it's a joke. Is really a joke. So right here, Trump is hinting at the idea that there are people that are trying to open up reservations at that time who shouldn't be merely because they're not even full blooded Indians joking by saying he's more of an Indian than they are when he's actually alluding that some of these people looks just like him, but could claim to be an Indian unmolested and it's not right. I must followed up by saying, a couple of these Indians in Connecticut look like Michael Jordan, frankly. Trump said, I think if you ever been up there, you would truly say that these are not Indians. One of them was telling me that his name is Chief Running Water Sitting Bull. And I said, that's a long name. And he said, well, just call me Ricky Sanders. So this is one of those Indians. I'll tell you, they got duped in Washington. And it's just one of those things that we have to straighten out. End quote. Now here, Don Imus makes the statement that a couple of these Indians up in Connecticut look like Michael Jordan, frankly, which is his comedic way of telling the truth. But then Trump starts his reply to him with, I think if you've ever been up there, 
alluding to Imus that he hasn't seen what Trump has recently witnessed there. And it's apparent that things have since been changed or is totally different from what someone may assume it was originally. Trump detailed a hidden message with his story where he referenced a chief running water sitting bull, but also known as Ricky Sanders. Trump is alluding to the many pseudonyms used by Benjamin Franklin as the author of various published books, like for example, The Poor Richard's Almanac was written by Richard Saunders on December 19, 1732. But this is also one of the alleged pseudonyms used by Benjamin Franklin himself. So Trump was indicating here that some of these Indians are simply disguising themselves as being someone that they are not. Who got duped in Washington, according to what Trump is referencing here, is the government, or Congress rather, because they allowed the Committee of Indian Affairs to approve of various people to now become Indians a part of a nation when they truly have no ethnical indigenous background or pre-colonial connections to any tribe to even be there as members in the first place. After this radio interview with Don Imus, here's Trump three months later, August 5th, 1993, on national television. So Donald Trump was not only exposing the fraud connected to the billion dollar gaming industry, he was also exposing just how fraud some of the Indian leaders of some of the newly established Indian nations are as well. Which should make you ask some serious questions. Like, why is there a committee in existence whose duty is to accept or decline applications to become a member of an Indian nation of America? Why must you apply to become an American Indian versus proving that you are Indian by way of records of one's family relations that do exist? Why do you think that some Indian nations only accept specific documents of particular time periods and not all documents of key time periods? Why is it promoted to so-called blacks to take genealogy DNA tests to prove their genetic makeup when all of the Indian nations do not accept genealogy DNA test results as evidence of one's genetic makeup overall? Why should so-called blacks accept it and the Indians don't? Keep in mind that this was the May 18th 1993 radio interview used in part during Donald Trump's testimony hearing five months later on October 5th, 1993. So when you watch the rest of his response to George Miller, now you know exactly who Trump is referring to. And then you went on to, the, is this you discussing Indian blood? We're going to judge people by whether they have Indian blood, whether they're qualified to run a gaming casino or not? Uh, uh, that probably is me, absolutely. Because I'll tell you what, if you look, if you look at some of the reservations that you've approved, you, sir, and your great wisdom have approved, I will tell you right now, uh, they don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like the Indians. Now, maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct. They don't look like Indians to me, and they don't look like Indians to Indians. And a lot of people are laughing at it, and you're telling how tough it is, how rough it is to get approved. Well, you go up to Connecticut, and you look. Now, they don't look like Indians to me, sir. They don't look like Indians to me, sir. I'm just here to make you think. 